We're continuing with the Mishnah that was mentioning various events um, that happened towards the second, the end of the second Bet HaMikdash when there was a serious decline and they were going to go into um, after the destruction of the second Bet HaMikdash and all kinds of the negative consequences um, that occurred in, in the world and to the Jewish people uh, at that time. Mishemet Yoseh ben Yo'ezer. Mishnah said that uh, when uh, Yoseh ben Yo'ezer died, then the Eshkolot stopped. My Eshkolot. Amar of Yudah Amar Shemuel Ish Kol Bo. Eshkolot is a concatenation of Ish Kol, a man who has everything. As we said, like a Renaissance man, people that were had had Torah knowledge and uh, good deeds and leaders, and they were able to encompass everything. After that, there's specialties. People are good at certain things, but not someone who has everything altogether. Yochanan Kohen Gadol Hebir Hodayat Ma'aser. We mentioned that Yochanan, the Kohen Gadol, he stopped. Uh, the uh, declaration of Maaser uh, that said at the end of Devarim, after and the uh, after, at the end of the third and the sixth year, person says, right? I I took care of, I got rid of all the Maaser of the past three years. I made sure to allocate it and took it out of the house. Um, why did he stop this declaration? My Tama, Amar Rabbi Yosef, Rabbi Chanina, Rabbi Shen, not Nino, Toki, Tiku, No. The Rachamana, Amar Rabbi Yosef, Rabbi So Rabbi Yosef explained that. People are no longer giving the ma'asid in the right, in the normal way, in the proper way. Why? Because the Torah says you should give ma'asid ishon to the Leviim. But at our time, we give it to the Kohanim. They're doing this for a good reason. That Ezra noticed, this is at the beginning of the second Bet HaMikdash period, that the Leviim, many of the Leviim, too many, stayed in Babel, they were comfortable there, and they did not come to Eretz Yisrael to come and serve the Bet HaMikdash and to serve the Jewish people and all the ways that Leviim are supposed to serve. Since they're not serving, they don't deserve to get the Maser, um, uh, the Maser uh, Rishon that otherwise would be coming to them. So as I said, as a penalty, you're not coming to Israel and serving the Jewish people. So now, no longer will you get the Maser. Everybody has, you still have to separate the Maser, but give it to the Kohanim instead. So people were doing this for a good reason. Ezra made this takana. Nevertheless, because they're not giving it to the Levi, they can't say in the declaration, I gave it to the Levi. So we ask, So fine, still, still say the vidui ma'asir for the other types of ma'asir. Is ma'asir shini, uh, that the person eats himself in the Yerushalayim, ma'asir ani, right? Depending on the year, there's different kinds of ma'asir, and uh, he's, he can say the vidui for those. says, any house that um, you, 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 in which you cannot say the declaration about Maaser Ishan, you can't say about the other types of Maserot either. Uh, why? But he explains because that's the first thing that he says, right? I gave it, I gave it to the Levi, and then he says, I gave it to the stranger and the orphan. The first thing you mention is, I gave the proper Maaser to the Levi. Once you can't say that first statement, even though it's for a good reason, so you can't say the rest of it either. It's an all or nothing. And that's why. Uh, the uh, they stop saying the vidui ma'asir. Now, um, so we it can uh, see from the uh, this uh, this source above that the people were in fact ta- were in fact taking ma'asir properly, except uh, other than the fact that Ezra told them you should give it to the kohanim instead of leviim. But otherwise, they were separating ma'asir and doing all the other ma'asrot in the proper way. Is that true? Vehatanya. Uh, we have in a Tosefta that Rabbi Yochanan also, he did two things. Not only did he cancel the Vidui Maaser, he also made another Gezera regarding Demai. That if you acquire produce from an Ama'aretz as opposed to a Chaver. Chaverim are part of a group that they commit themselves, they're very careful in to remote masrot. But a regular amaritz, some of them, most of them, they, they do tirumah, because that's very uh, stringent, but some of them take maaser, some of them don't. And therefore, since people are lax about it, the amaritz, he made a gezera that everybody, if you acquire uh, produce from an amaritz, you have to consider it demai, meaning da mai, we're not sure the status of it, and you should be, as of stringency, 
take to the ma and ma said also. So it uh, sounds like from here that uh, m many people were not taking uh, Ma'asir. And here we have the whole story. He did a survey in all the borders of Israel and he found that people are taking to the Ma'asir. That's the first 2% that you give to a Kohen. Uh, people were doing that, first of all, because it's only a small amount, 2%. Uh, on average, you can give uh, whatever you want. And um, this is very stringent because Teruma is holy, only Kohen can eat it, has to be in Betahara. So people were uh, were serious about that and would give it. Um, but the other Maaser Hishon, Maaser Sheni, some people did it, some people didn't because these types of Maaser. Um, doesn't have a holy status. Anyone can eat them. Like, you know, I mean, I have to give it to Elevi or give it to Dani, but if they want to resell it or give it, you know, or share it, it doesn't have holy status. It has to be in only by certain, anyone could eat it. Um, it doesn't have to be in Betahara. And so um, people were not so careful in giving the maaser, and so therefore Yochanan went and rebuked them. Malem banai bo ve'amal lachem k'eshem shetzur magidol yesh ba'avon mita kach terumat maaser ve'tebel yesh ba'hen avon mita. He said, "Listen, I'm just you should be more careful, everyone. Just like terumat gedola, there's mita bide shamayim. If someone does not separate uh, the terumat and eats it, and so too terumat maaser and tebel, also there's avon mita bide shamayim." So so you got to take this, you know, within the maaser uh, that you give to Levi. Levi himself gives uh, a part, a tenth of that to the kohen, right? So these these are very serious matters. Everybody should take them more seriously. And then he made it. This is made when he made this takana. If you buy produce from an Amaaretz, and so many of them are not careful. So you have to go ahead and make sure to take Maaser Ishon and Maaser Shani from the Maaser Ishon. You have to make sure to give the Turmat Maaser to the Kohen. Maaser Shani, Olev, Ochlo, Birushala, Maaser Ishon, Maaser Anim, Osim, Achabero, Olav, Hadaya. Now, you only have to give that part to the Kohen, because that only the Kohen can eat. However, when you're taking this from the, when you when have this produce from uh, the Ama'aretz, uh, since it's possible that the Ama'aretz did take uh, Ma'asir, some of them do, some of them don't, so then out of Chumrah, you have to separate them, right? You have to designate the, the part on the right, that tenth, that'll be uh, Ma'asir Shini, right? Or Ma'asir Ani. So you do have to designate them, how, uh, or Ma'asir Ishan. Um, so you have to designate them. However, um, uh, you don't have to actually give them. So the Maser Sheni, you, call, you go and eat it in Jerusalem because you're eating it yourself anyway. And just in case he didn't take Maser Sheni, so you eat the Maser Sheni. You're, uh, you're going to eat it anyway. You're going to take it with you when you go for Aliyah Laregel or any time. And so that's fine. The other is the Maser Ishan that's supposed to go to Levi. Maser is supposed to go to the poor person. You don't have to give it to them because maybe it was already given to them. And we have a principle, Mosim uh, so now he has a, a, um, a monetary obligation to give it to them, right? He separated it out already, so then the rest of it is is now not table anymore, right? The other 90%, 80% he can eat. Um, and this, if the uh, levy or the poor person wants to come and take it, he has to prove that the first Ama'aretz did not take the Ma'asir, and then says, so okay, fine, I'll give it to you. But the burden of proof is on the person who um, who wants to take it, and so therefore I, as the buyer, I have uh, I don't have to prove. Um, I can just separate it, and then if nobody comes to claim it, then I can eat it myself. This is actually what we do today. Um, as uh, in Israel now, when uh, someone has to take to the Ma'ama said, to the you have to destroy because uh, everybody's Tameh, uh, uh, and so the Kohanim cannot eat it. Um, so that's uh, that you can't give it uh, to a Kohen. However, the other ones, the other uh, Ma'asir, uh, we uh, the, we separate. And then we say, Let a, who, so who knows who's a Levi nowadays, right? Let them come and prove that this person, that they're a Levi, and then they can come and take it. Okay. Um, so now this is all the, the, the question um, uh, that the, um, 
uh, uh, the Braita said that not everybody would be taking um, a tiruma at the time, a ma'asir at the time of Yohanan. So here's a, here's a question, right? Because above here, we said that he said, don't take, don't say vidui ma'asir anymore. Uh, because they're giving it to the le- Kohen instead of the Levi. But it sounds like they are, in fact, taking Maaser. But from this source, who says he, where he said, oh, he, he did a survey and people aren't taking Maaser at all. So it sounds like there's a further problem. So that's not that's the reason why they wouldn't take, do, be doing Maaser isn't just because they're doing it properly, just giving it to the Kohen instead of Levi. So we explain Tatetiken. He made two Takanot. Bitel vidui chata chaberim ve gazar demai shalam mehaaretz for chaberim who take maaser properly, he said, "Don't say vidui maaser because you're giving it to the kohen instead of the levi, which you're supposed to be doing, but nevertheless you just can't say the paragraph that text." That's for chaberim, but for ame haaretz they were not careful in taking maaser, and then that he made this uh, takana that anyone who buys maaretz should give demai, which is we're going to refer to in a. Uh, in a couple of minutes within the Mishnah. So here it's already, it's preempting and explaining that line in the Mishnah that we'll see a bit later. Okay, good. Vav hu bitel et ha-me'odari et ha-me'oderim. Yochanan Kohen Gadol also canceled out the awakeners. What were they? My me'oderim. Amar hava bechol yom ve'yom shayu omdim leviyim al duchan ve'omrim ura lama tishan Hashem. Amar lehen v'chi yesh shana lefnei ha-makom. So these leviyim, they were very excited about starting the new day in the Bet HaMikdash and they would awaken the, the the service, they uh, the Avodah and the Bet HaMikdash, and they would come every morning for First thing and say, uh, quote a pasuk from Tehilim. It says, "Awake! Why do you sleep, Hashem?" Um, as if this is Hashem's abode. And so at night, there's no activity in Bet Hamikdash, and now they're excited to start the the morning at, uh, service. So they're waking up as if waking up Hashem. Now they're quoting a pasuk, so you know it should be okay. However, Yochanan said. Uh, people are getting the wrong idea here. What are you implying that Hashem sleeps? Hashem never sleeps. Um, so you shouldn't say this. Rather, what is that pasuk actually about? Rather, when there is a time when um, Israel is suffering and other nations are peaceful and they are persecuting Israel, then you look around at the world and you say, there's imbalance. What's going on here? Hashem's chosen nation is downtrodden like this. Why should that be? Hashem, why are you sleeping? So it's an expression of extreme uh, 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 prayer coming out of pain and anguish at a difficult time. In that context, it's appropriate to use that kind of strong language to say, you know, as if Hashem is sleeping because he's not, he's not, uh, uh, he, uh, we, we don't see his hand, his providential hand in saving. And we're asking Hashem, please, you know, come and intervene. Fine, that's appropriate to say. At a time of uh, at, at a time of suffering, but it's not appropriate to say every morning as if Hashem goes to sleep every night. So he stopped that practice. I he also stopped the strikers. My nokefim, Amar of Yudah Mar Shemuel, Shayu Mesartin Laegel Ben Karnav Kedeshi Pol Dam Be'anav Atayi Hu Batel Mishum Deme Chazek Kimu Ma. What happened is that the um, uh, the the uh, the shochatim, the butchers uh, in the Bet Hamikdash, they would scratch the calf um, uh, between its horns so that the blood will fall in its eyes and the animal wouldn't be able to see. And then the Kohan, the, the whoever is doing the shechita, they would be able able to um, uh, slaughter it more easily because it couldn't see and it's all disoriented. So then it's easier to uh, uh, position it and uh, and it won't uh, move around and um, and they could do shechita more easily. However, Yochanan Kohen Gadol saw that and says, oh, it looks like you're putting a blemish, right? You're you're making a, a cut in it, in it on its head and uh, that's like a blemish. These are sacrificial animals and so you should not do that. Um, okay. Another interpretation is that the, um, the, 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 those who were butchering, slaughtering the animals in the Bet HaMikdash would actually beat them with sticks first. Like the idolaters, the pagans did. Apparently they would bang them on the head, kind of stun them, uh, knock them unconscious, and then it was easy to 
to do shechita. The problem is that makes that makes the animal not kosher. If you uh, you bang the animal on its head uh, sufficiently hard, then it will actually make it a terefa. So we ask, wait, nevelot? Nevelot means you killed it without shechita. But ha they're doing proper shechita while, while it's still alive. So it's not a problem actually of nevela. Nevela would be, you know, if it died on its own out of sickness or if you um, shoot it in the head or something. That would be nevela. But here you're doing shechita while it's alive. Ela terefot shema nikav kirum shel mawach amad v'itkin lahem tabaot bakarka. Rather, what we mean to, when we say nevelot, we mean just not kosher. But more precisely, it means terefot. Um, because if they hit the head hard enough, it will cause a perforation in the membrane surrounding the brain. That's one of the terefot. The animal will, is not healthy, will not be able to live uh, for a long time, and therefore it's not kosher and cannot be used as a korban. So he stopped this practice, um, but he solved the problem a different way, recognizing that it's hard to control the animals. So he decided that they're going to put these rings on the floor. This is the mizbeach here. And these are rings, 24 of them. Each um, uh, uh, group of Kohanim had their own. And so they, they would put the, the, uh, the animal, they would lay it down and put its neck in, in the ring. And then, uh, then it wouldn't be able to move and they, they, they could do Shechita properly. And so that's the way he was able to solve the problem without these other uh, um, uh, problematic measures. Ajamav haya patish the Mishnah also says, until Yochanan Kohen Gadol's time, they were they were they were smiths. They were hammering in, hammering in the streets of Jerusalem during. Uh, we explain this during Cholam Moed. It was permitted to do that. They were fixing things. Let's say that you need for the holiday itself, right? Uh, I need this pot. I need to 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 you know wear these shoes <clears throat> on the holiday. So you're allowed to do that things that are on Cholam Moed for the holiday. However, it was making a lot of noise and disturbing the atmosphere, uh, the festive atmosphere, and so he stopped it. And finally, the Mishnah says, in all that time, people didn't have to go ask about this produce. Um, is it, did you take Maaser? Did you not take Maaser? Because he made a Gezera, as we mentioned before, that if you buy, take from, uh, from, a, from a, um, uh, Ama'aretz, don't even ask questions, just take Maaser, because a lot of the time they don't take Maaser. So you know what? We just make a blanket uh, rule across the board. Everyone should take Maaser. Okay, next Mishnah. Mishabat Sanhedrin, Batel Hashir Mi Beta Mishnah Shnemad, Bashir Lo Yishtu Yayin. From the time that the Sanhedrin stopped, um, the Sanhedrin was in the Bet Mikdash in Lishkat Hagazit, and already before the Bet Mikdash was destroyed, the Sanhedrin had to disband. Um, because of the, um, uh, the, the the tumultuous time. And so from that time, there's no more singing in the place of feasts, right? When people are getting together and having a party, no more, um, uh, no more, no more, no more music. And so there's a source of a halacha that is, um, at least uh, it is on the books, and a lot of halachic discussion about how it applies, when it applies. Um, but basically, no more music when there's no Sanhedrin. Uh, when the early Nevi'im uh, ceased, then there was no more Urim Betumim, which the Kohen Gadol wore, and was used as a way of, uh, of, of communicating with Hashem and receiving divine messages. Didn't work anymore after the first Nevi'im. Uh, when the Bet HaMikdash was destroyed, the Shamir, that special uh, worm that was able to cut things, um, that was gone. And the sweetness of the honeycomb, the very taste of honey and honeycomb uh, became less sweet. Um, that's Nofet Sufim. And also the people, uh, uh, the, the, the people of faith have ceased, right? As this is the source of our prayer on She Emuna Avadu, and it comes from this Pasuk, right? Help us Hashem, because um, there are no more Hasidim, there are no more people of faith. Further, from the day the Bet HaMikdash was destroyed, um, there is no day that doesn't have some curse. And when the dew falls, it's not for blessing. And even the taste of fruit has been removed. I mean, we taste fruit, it tastes good, but it, it tasted better 
before the destruction of the Bet HaMikdash. Rabbi Yosei Omer, Afnit HaShuman HaPerot, even the fat of the fruit has been removed. Uh, maybe some people on a diet would like this, right? Fat-free fruit. Um, but he means the, 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 the goodness, the taste of it is gone. Rabbi Shimon ben Lazar Omer, HaTahora Natla Et HaTam Ve'et HaReya, HaMasrot Natu Et Shuman HaDagan, HaChamim Omonim HaZenut VeHaKeshafim Kilu Et HaKol. Rabbi Shimon ben Lazar said that because we lost purity, the taste and the, and the smell of fruit is gone. Um, because now people aren't giving ma'aser, the, the fat of the grain is removed, right? The grain doesn't have the same uh, richness that it had before. However, Chachamim say, no, it's not, be, it's not for that reason. It's not because the people uh, are, 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 it's not because of a loss of Tahara and the loss of Ma'asad, but rather because Zinut and witchcraft uh, are, in, are increased. And that's what, that's, they, that's what destroyed all of these other good things that would be in the world. Um, as a punishment for uh, for those sins. And now we ask, uh, that pasuk that you mentioned, that there's no songs anymore, no music anymore because of the Sanhedrin. This, this pasuk in Yeshaya um, uh, doesn't say anything about Sanhedrin. So how do you know it's talking about that? Pasuk says that the elders have ceased from the gates. The elders would sit at the gates. This is talking about the, the, the judges. And I mean, they also sat in the Bet HaMikdash, but also there was a, um, a Betin uh, that sat at the gate when people would come and go. And they would sit there for, uh, be there ready for judgment. And then it continues and says that the, the young men stopped their music. So you see, it is talking about uh, uh, judges um, and therefore, it's talking about the Sanhedrin as well. That there's, and once there's no Sanhedrin, there's no more singing. And ear that hears song should be uprooted. If there's song in a house, there'll be destruction at the threshold of that house. As Pasuk and Sefania says, voices uh, shall sing in the windows. Desolation shall be in the doorposts, for its cedar work shall be uncovered. What does it mean that the cedar is uncovered? After all, adding to the question, if you have a house that has cedar work, a part of it, then it should be as strong as a city. Cedars are the strongest wood. It's like saying um, a house is built with still steel beams. So why would that, why was that be an indication that it would be weak and uh, and uh, get ruined? Rather, the Pasuk is saying, even if it has cedar wood in it, nevertheless, it will weaken if there is music playing in the house. Since it says that the destruction will happen from the from the saf, the saf meaning the doorpost or the the threshold, the entrance. We see that when a house starts to deteriorate, uh, it starts from the entrance. Uh, and other others learn the same lesson from this pasuk in Yeshaya that the gate is smitten unto ruin. Uh, this uh, word shia, some say it's some kind of destructive demon. Some say it's talking about uh, worms that eat through wood. Um, and uh, um, so either way, this is something that will attack um, the uh, the entrance, the the, the doorposts. Um, and Mor Barav said, "I saw it, and it was like it was like an ox goring. That that's how much destruction it do, uh, it did." Um, to the entrance. Okay, so now we're going to explain further um, what kind of songs. Note, by the way, that you know, usually when people say, oh, because uh, because the Beta Mikdash is destroyed, we can't have music anymore, which is true, but it's not spe- it's not the, the, it's specifically for San- Sanhedrin. Usually when people think of the destruction of Beta Mikdash, they mourn over the fact that there's no sacrifices. But sacrifices actually was only one part of the activity of Beta Mikdash. Perhaps even more important was the activity of the Sanhedrin, the legal uh, Supreme Court, you know, uh, uh, teaching Torah, adjudicating cases, keeping the uh, justice. 
um, in the nation, right? This is what is actually the focus here. That's precisely because no Sanhedrin. That's such a sad thing that we cannot listen to music anymore. Okay, Ravuna, however, gives um, gives a, a an out that in some cases is permitted. Uh, for those who are pulling a ship or leading a herd, it's permitted. Here's a picture of some people that are pulling a ship. Um, so you might have like a, a stream, or a little river or something, and you want to move things. And you have a lot of people, it's heavy, so you have a lot of people that have to that are pulling on the ropes and they have to walk in lockstep. And so um, they might they would be singing a song in order to keep the rhythm so that they are all going to be uh, rowing or pulling at the same time or leading a herd. Anytime you have to march in unison and keep everybody on the beat. So here the singing is there to help the work. You need it for to help the work and it's not just for enjoyment. However, for a weaver, they would sing while they're weaving because weaving is a very monotonous activity and so they would be weaving just to uh just to keep to, just for enjoyment while they're working so that is prohibited because you're doing it for enjoyment however if you're doing it for a uh, productive reason then it's permitted some of these laws you see in uh in the laws about the Omer, like you know during the Omer, even though you don't listen to music but if you need to listen to it for a professional reason for uh, um for, to help you uh, exercise right for other reasons like that um then it's permitted Rav Huna Batil Zimra. Uh, uh, so Rav Huna, he stopped all the songs um, and in his town, and because of that, his town was blessed. The price of a hundred ducks was only one dinar, and a hundred of wheat only one dinar, and even that, uh, there was it was so plenty, uh, there was so much plenty that even at that cheap cheap price, people didn't even buy it. Um, so that's how, how, how rich and great things were, because they uh, um, remembered the sadness of not having a Sanhedrin properly, so they were blessed. And then Avchista came, and he said, okay, it's not so, it's not such a, a, a strict prohibition, it's okay, you could, you could sing, you could have music. And because of that, now there was uh, scarcity, and you couldn't even buy a, one duck for a dinar, and even at that price, you, could buy, you couldn't find one. Um, now more about singing, uh, music in general should be stopped because of the loss of the Sanhedrin. However, uh, in particular, if men sing and women are responding, then that's pedisut. Even worse is if women are singing and the men are answering, then that's going to lead to mixed dancing. It's like a fire to a chip. You take a chip that's easily burnt. So, you know, people always have natural desires. And now you add this to it, it's going to set them on fire, uh, their desire is going to rouse their desire and lead to sin. What's the difference? Which one is worse? If they're both bad, so they're both bad. The answer is, which one to nullify first? So let's say, you know, there's a, a group and you can't, they're not going to stop doing everything, but you can stop them from doing something. They're still going to sing, so at least stop the woman from singing and the men responding, because that's worse. Says, anyone who drinks wine while be, there's accompaniment of four in, musical instruments, he's going to bring suffering to the world. As Pasuk says, well, those who rise early in the morning so that they can go and have drinks, or they stay up late until the night, and they and the drinking is they become drunk, while the four instruments, Kinor, Nebel, Tof, and Halil, and they're drinking wine at the same time, but you know, you see from there that that's what they're interested in just partying and forgetting about everything and they are not doing the work of Hashem, right? To have a drink once in a while, 
for Kiddush, right? That's okay. But these people, that's their main thing that they're doing. I think you see here the kind of context um, that they're thinking about when they think about music. Remember, there was no recorded music. So it's not just like, you know, listening to some background music or some, you know, some blues if you're in a sad mood. Um, but rather, uh, uh, typically, people would be playing music at a bar, at a drunken party. So this music was often associated with um, kind of over-the-top or lewd uh, um, uh, things would be problem no matter what. Um, but it's the, uh, but especially after the destruction of the Sanhedrin, Sanhedrin, some commentaries write, would be uh, would go around and make sure that uh, you know if people are having uh, hefle or something that they're having you know good nice nice music pizmonim and things don't go out of hand and um, um, uh, they're uh, they're doing it l'shem shamayim and so when you can control it then it's a good thing uh, but out of control it could be very bad and so when there's no sanhedrin then these kinds of uh, parties are not appropriate. Now, after this uh, this listing of sin, the next pasuk in Yeshaya, it says, Therefore, my people have gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. Because they do this and they're drinking all day and not not learning and not doing, so they bring um, they bring exile into the world. It's an interesting phrase. So, because they're already in exile, but there's kind of levels of exile, right? They make things worse. And the Pasu continues and said that um, even uh, the honorable men are famished. They're going to bring famine to the world. And here they're, they're going to be thirsty. We read this metaphorically, a thirst for Torah. Which compared to water, they've caused that to be forgotten. Because after all, if they're drinking all the time, they're not teaching, they're not um, uh, reviewing. And when the pasuk says that a uh, man will go down, ish is referring. It says here the enemy of, of Hashem, but because we don't want to say Hashem that goes down, but really we mean Hashem that causes God to have, as if. Uh, be lower down um, because God's glory. This is these are the uh, you know these are uh, important people uh, that should be the leaders, the sages, and instead they're sitting and getting drunk and partying all day. So since they represent Hashem's uh, um, uh, presence in the world and they're doing this, so they actually cause God's reputation to be lower down. Um, and and ish ela kadosh baruch hu Hashem ish milchama Hashem is called the ish here. Ve'nei gevohim. And those that are that should be exalted, low down. This is the people of Israel that should be a light unto the nations, doing good things, um, and instead the, their leaders are just uh, uh, in drunken parties, and so this is going to bring the whole nation uh, to be low down. Makativa harav, and let's continue with the next pasuk. Um, therefore, the Sheol, the underworld, has enlarged your desire. More people will, will, will die, go to the underworld, open their mouth without measure, and that <coughs> goes their glory. Tell an uproar, and he who rejo- and he, he he rejoices among them. So that'll be the end of the punishment of those who are <clears throat> simply rejoicing with uh, music and drinking, um, uh, and and not thinking about avodat Hashem, especially after the time of the Sanhedrin. Uh, now, next thing is when there's no more early uh, prophets, then the orim v'tumim. Was no longer effective. Who are these? Man neviim harishonim. Amar Rav Huna said, "David Shmuel Ushlama Ushlama." These are the very early uh, uh, prophets, David and Shmuel and Shlomo. Shmuel was really earlier, um, and these are the early prophets. Okay. Rav Nachman Amar Bimei David Zimnin Salik VeZimnin La Salik Shere Shal Sadok Val Talo Shal Ebiata VeLo Al Talo Shneimar VaYal Ebiata Rav Nachman explains that even during the time of David, already the Urim VeTumim were on the blink. Sometimes they worked, and sometimes they did not. Were not effective because this is the context is David. 
David's son of Shalom rebelled against him. And David had to run away out of Jerusalem and take all his people with him. Um, and at the time, he was asking the Urim Tumim about uh, for advice. And he asked Sadok, who was uh, just a regular Kohen, and it, it, it worked for him. Eviatar, the Kohen Gadol, did not work for him. And because of that, Vayal Eviatar, Eviatar was removed. Um, so you see that it worked for one Kohen, but didn't work for another Kohen. So we're already... Um, not working all the time, and then after that, it didn't work at all. Um, after Shalomo, Mativ Rabba Bar Shemo Elohi Lidrosh Elohim Bimezicharyahu Hamevin Berot Elohim Mila Berim Vetumim. We have a question because here we have a much later King Uziyah. And he went to ask something from Hashem in the time of uh, of Zechar Yahu. And so doesn't that mean that he went to ask through the Urim Tumim? And that means the Urim Tumim were effective even much later, many, many years later, um, after David and Shilamo. And we answer, Allah, but it does say Urim Tumim here, means he went to ask the Prophet. Right? When you, said, when you say, Lidrosh uh, Elohim, he went to ask a Prophet. The Prophet, can you prophesy and tell me uh, some uh, the answer? to this. So that's no problem. Tashema. Mishe Khara Beta Mikdash Rishon Batlu Are Migrash Paskuri Vitumim Pasak Melech Mi Bet David. We have another challenge here that says um uh, that from the time that the first Bet Mikdash was destroyed, there's no more uh, s- uh fields that are outside the, the, the cities of the Levi'im that's allocated to them that they get to take that one thousand, two thousand Amot. So that uh, law uh ceased to be relevant and Uri Vitumim also uh, uh, stopped, and um, there was no more king from the house of Judea. That's true. In fact, um, after the first, after the last uh, kings, Yoyachin, um, Sidkiah, they were the last kings of Judea. Throughout the entire second Bet Hamikdash, we had no kings from uh, the lineage. Uh, we did have Hashmonaim, who took upon themselves the title of king. But they were Kohanim, and so that was not really appropriate because they were not from the right uh, um, they were not from the right lineage, and so we no longer had any kings from the the Vedic dynasty. Now, continuing the same Braita, you just said that the Urim Tumim stopped at the end of the first Bet HaMikdash. But if someone might whisper a question to you and say, from quote this Pasuk, this is from Ezra, that Tir Shata, that's another name for Nehemiah. In Nehemiah, there were people that came that were doubtful Kohanim. They didn't have their, 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 their no, their, they didn't have their family tree. And so we didn't know if they were uh, legitimate, proper Kohanim or not. So he said, listen, you can't eat from the Kodash Kodashim until we have a Kohen with Urim Vitumim. Now, doesn't that suggest that um, he's expecting Urim Vitumim to come back online any, any day now? And so even in the beginning of the second Bet HaMikdash, they also had Urim Vitumim, right? Doesn't that mean that? He's like, you know, wait here, we're going to wait until Urim Vitumim uh, comes, and, you know, maybe uh, next week, next year, and then I'll let you know if you can eat Kodesh Kodesh. Doesn't mean that there is to Urim Vitumim, and so don't say that, because they'll be wrong. Uh, if someone tells you that, tell them, no, this is like someone saying, right, uh, you know, I'll... I'll pay you a uh, hundred dollars uh, when uh, when the dead come back to life in Tchat Metim when Mashiach comes. It means like never, right? Uh, or a long, long time in the future. That's what he meant. That's what he meant to say. He said, uh, "You, you, this group family of Kohanim, the family. I don't know if you're Kohanim. We you know you can eat. You cannot eat Kodesh Kodashim until Mashiach comes, right? Uh, we'll ask Eliyahu. It's like saying that. It's pushing him off indefinitely." Um, and uh, and so, um, okay, that's the end of this Baraita. What do we see from this Baraita? Okay, it didn't go into the second Bet HaMikdash period, but it does say that Urim Tumim was effective until the end of the first Bet HaMikdash. So this is way later than David and Shalomah.
אלא אמר רב נחמן בן יצחק, מה נביאים הראשונים לפוקי מחגי זכריה ומלאכי דאחרונים ננהו? Rather, נחמן said that the נביאים ראשונים that are mentioned in the Mishnah are not talking about the very early people like David and Shilomo, but rather uh, just means all the prophets throughout the first Bet HaMikdash and comes to exclude Chagai, Zechariah, and Malachi. They were active at the beginning of the second Bet HaMikdash period. So they're called Achronim, the Achronim Ninhu. The Ten Rabbanah Mishemetu, Chagai, Zechariah, Malachi, Nistalaka, Ruach HaKodesh, Mishra, Vafa Pichen, Hayu Mishtamashim, Ebat Kol. As the Brayta says, when these last three Nevi'im died, that's it, there was no more Ruach HaKodesh in Israel prophecy at that level stopped, um, even though uh, they still used the bat call. The bat call, this heavenly echo, would come from time to time and uh, give people messages. Um, uh, but, so that's why they are called Achronim, because they are the end of prophecy. And, uh, but the Urim Vitumim were, in fact, in use throughout the first Bet HaMikdash. Shepam Achatim Mesubin Be'aliyat Bet Guriya Biricha. That will give some examples of a bat call. Uh, one time the sages were um, uh, were reclining, having a nice meal together in the upper story of Guriya, who was a rich person, and he hosted all the sages in Yericho. He had some palace there. Nitana lehen bat kol min hashamayim v'amra yesh b'chem adam echad shereuit shetishre shechina alav el hashen doror ra'uid lekach. Bat kol came and says, among you there's one person that is worthy to have shechina upon him, but it's the generation that is not worthy for it. Sometimes there is a person and that's, that's worthy, but the context where right? he needs a generation that's worthy to receive him and to hear him out. Not knowing the Hembilel as a kid, everybody knew who the Batko was talking about. It was Hillel the Elder. When he died, everybody eulogized him, saying, right, uh, alas for the pious one, alas for the humble one. He was a student of Ezra. Um, he, he, he knew Torah like, like as pristine. As from the time of Ezra. And similarly, in a later generation, uh, people, the sages, were uh, reclining in the upper story in Yavne. And the Batkol came and said, There's one among you that's worthy to have Shekhinah, right? worthy to be a prophet, to be a great leader. But the generation is not ready for him. And so, And everybody knew was talking about Shemuel HaKatan, and they gave him uh, the same eulogy. Uh, and But they said, right, uh, alas, a humble one, a pious one, the student of Hillel, right, because he was just like that, Hillel Hazaken. Shemuel HaKatan himself said, at the time that he died, she, uh, see, he had a little bit of uh, uh, prophecy. Shimon Ve'ishmael le'harba ve'chabro hi liktala u'shad ama le'biza ve'akan segi'in atidin le'mete al ama. So he died around the destruction of the of the Bet Hamikdash, second Bet Hamikdash in seventy, and he's predicting that uh, Shimon, that's the Shimon ben Gamliel, and Rabbi Shmael ben Isha, El Isha, the Kohen Gadol, are going to be killed by the sword, and their colleagues are going to be also killed, and the rest of the people for plunder and great troubles are going to happen. So he says, before the war with the Romans, he sees, I see bad things happening. So he um, is uh, saved from having seen all that by dying before. And there's another person that was worthy at that level, and that was Yehuda ben Baba. And when he died, they wanted to eulogize him with the same very special high praise that they only did for certain people that were worthy for Shekhinah. And they wanted to say, but the time uh, would not allow for it because they would not give eulogies to those killed by the Romans. Um, he was uh, one of the uh, uh, martyrs that was killed during the, during the Bar Kokhva revolt. And they would not eulogize him because the Romans would see, oh, you're eulogizing him, you must be uh, rebels also. And so if anyone did that, they would go and attack those eulogizers as being a part of the group. And so they were not able to eulogize him in public. Um, because of that terrible persecution. But he, really, he was worthy of that praise.
Mishachara Bet HaMikdash Batel HaShamir. Now, back to the Mishnah that says, when there's no Bet HaMikdash, there was no more of this special Shamir snail that was able to cut through things. Tenor Banan Shamir Shebo Banan Shelomo at Bet HaMikdash Lemar Vabayt Bihibano To Eben Shelema Masa Nibna Hadivrim Kichtavan Tibre Rebi Yehuda. This is uh, the uh, uh, Shamir that King Shelomo used when he wanted to build a Bet HaMikdash because it says there, the house now it says Habayit. It's not clear. Is it the palace, his own personal palace, or the Bet Hamikdash? We'll see that in a minute. Uh, while it was being built, it was built with whole stones from the quarry, and so he, uh, the Biuda says we should take this literally that he took whole stones. Well, how did he, how did he cut? How did he, I mean, uh, the stones have to fit uh, uh, nicely? So what does that mean that he did that he had these nice stones without cutting them? Because he didn't cut them with a metal. He cut it with the shamir. Okay, it doesn't say anything about the Shamir in the Pesukim. This is all from the Midrash. Hold on, Rabbi Nechemia says. It says in the in in the uh, uh, in the in the pesukim in Nechemia that these were costly stones and they were sawed with saws. It says that they did use metal saws to cut the stones. Why are you saying that it was the shamir? So how is Rabbi Nechemia going to explain that first pasuk that said they didn't hear the sound? of um, anything being cut. It means that they cut them with metal outside, far away, and then they brought the stones when they were done. So that way, on site at the Bet HaMikdash, they didn't have to hear the terrible noise of construction. All the neighbors would complain. No neighbors, but the point is it would be disrespectful to have all that noise. Rather, they did all the noisy work out uh, outside, far away, with metal uh, objects, and then they would carry those huge stones and put them in place and that was a more respectful way to build it. So, uh, so now we have a machloket. The Biuda says, Asher King Shalomo used the Shamir to build the Bet HaMikdash. Rabbi Nechemia says, no, he used metal to, to, to cut the stones. He just did it far for the Bet HaMikdash. So, Rabbi says, I can reconcile these two opinions that they're not disagreeing. And the Biuda that it says he used the Shamir, I think that is referring to the Bet HaMikdash. Whereas, where Rabbi Nechemia, he was talking about when King Shilomo built his own palace. For the, the Shamir is a special thing that is used only for uh, the Bet HaMikdash to cut the stones there. It's very, very special. Um, but for his own palace, that also, he wanted it to be done without bothering anybody in the neighborhood and doing it in a, in a, a high-class way. And so that's why he had everything cut before prefab and then brought on site. According to Rabbi Nechamia, who says all those pisukim, both for Shalomo's house and for the Bet HaMikdash, they're, all, they're all, all talking about stones that were cut with metal. Even the Bet HaMikdash stones were cut with metal, but there was no sound there, heard thereby be, there because they cut them outside. So according to Rabbi Nechamia, there was no need for any shamir to cut stones. So he asked Rabbi Nechamia, don't you have a tradition about the shamir also? What, would, what did, did they use the shamir? Made for if not for cutting stones? And the answer is Even though they had the rather they were needed for the stones of the breastplate and the ephod um, that you have to inscribe the names of each of the shivatim on it. Now you can't use ink on it because it says engraved like a signet ring, and you can't engrave it with uh, with a scalpel because because it has to be time in their fullness. And if you uh, and, uh, uh, scrape the parts of those gems off, then they're not going to be full anymore. They're going to be missing that part that you scrape out. So how can you engrave them? Rather, they would write on it in ink, but the ink was there just as a um, uh, to trace 
to, to trace the line, and then they would bring the shamir close. The shamir wouldn't have to touch it. It was kind of like a laser. Um, and they did it from, uh, they brought it close to it. And then as soon as it was brought close, the gem would open up in those, in those right where the uh, ink was, it would have a little opening, um, like a, uh, like a fig that splits open, splits open in the summer when it's so full, right? It just, it opens up. So there is a cut in it, but not because you removed anything, um, or like the valley that cracks in the rainy season. So it's not that it's not that you're taking uh, making a, a a hole by digging, but rather the earth itself cracks. So that's the same way that um, that that's uh, that's how the shamir works, so that you can have an engraving uh, without actually uh, removing any of the material so they were still full. So this was, you need a very special tool. That's what the Shamir did. Shamir was very small, the size of a kernel of barley. And it was created on the six days of creation, during the six days of, uh, um, from the, uh, in, during the six days of creation. Mishnah in Masech Davot says it was created during Ben Hashem Ashot on, uh, on, uh, on Friday afternoon, among other things. Right? The list there, the point of the list there is that to say there's going to be future things that are, uh, uh, uh supernatural, but they're also embedded as potentials within, within nature, already there at creation, um, and so, um, but just waiting for their uh, need to come about, but they're already uh, actually part and embedded within the creation at the time of, uh, within, uh, within nature at the time of creation. Ben kol davar kashe yachol amod befanav, but and the shamir, so strong, nothing is so hard. Uh, that nothing is hard that can withstand it, like a cutting with a diamond. Now here's the problem: how can you uh, how can you uh, store it? Anything you put it in any any storage box you put it in, it will just make a hole through it. So the answer is: Kolchin Oto Bisfogin Shel Semer Manichin Oto Beitne Shel Er Abad Melea Sube Seorin. You wrapped it in sponges. Here's some sponges that you might find um, under uh, under the uh, a sea. And um, because they're soft, so the shamir only uh, penetrates hard things and you know breaks them open. But these are soft, so they just you know they uh, they they they're not gonna break open. Um, uh, to, so you wrap it in uh, sponges of wool, and and that you put in a vessel of lead, which is you know kind of strong, so that it that combination full of barley bran, uh, which is also soft. So this combination of stuffing and something hard on the outside, that keeps it safe. Amar Rabbi Ameh. Mi shekharab ha-mikdash rishon batla shira peranda uzhuchit lebana. So more things that we lost um, because of the destruction of the first be, first bet ha-mikdash um, are shiny silk and white glass. Tanya de Mehachi, another Braita that supports the Mishrab and Mikdash Rishon, but Lashira Paraneda, Uzhit Labana, same two things, plus Reche Barzel, also iron chariots, nice, a beautiful iron chariots. Vyashom Rim, Af Yayin Karush Haba Misenir, Hadomek Igule de Bela, also this kind of wine pudding that they used to have in Senir, that uh, was very delicious and that we don't have uh, uh, anymore. It was kind of like um, round fig cakes. Renofet Sufim, also we lost the sweetness of honeycomb with the destruction of the Bet HaMikdash. Mainofet Sufim, Amarav Sodet Shesafa Al Gaben Afa V'domar Le'isa Shenilosha Bidbash Veshemen. What is this Nofet Sufim? It's fine flour that goes to the top of a sieve and it tastes like dough kneaded with honey and oil. Sounds delicious. Ve'levi Amar Shete Kikarot Anid Bakot Betanu Ve'tofchot Ba'obaot Ad Shemagiot Zo Lazo. Levi said the Nofet Sufim is two loaves that puff up in the oven and stick together and it's just so puffy and delicious bread. Verebi Yoshua ben Levi Amar, Ze deva shaba min ha sipiya, my mashma. Yoshua says, It's honey that comes from these elevated areas, like Sofim, like Kado Sofim, these high mountain tops. Um, and where, how do you, how, where, where do you see that the, um, it means that? Kidimetagim Rav Sheshat Kema de Natsan de Briata, Veshaitan Berome Alma, Umatian Dubsha Meisbe Tura. He learns it from the Targum Uncle. 
for this pasuk in Devarim um, that says Emori that, that live in the mountain. They came to uh, upon you Bnei Israel when you tried to illegally go into the land, and they um, and they chased you like bees. Uh, chase someone in that place. The Targum adds in a little bit to that and says like bees that spread out and fly all over the world and bring honey from mountainous plains, plants. So you see that they come from the mountains and so that's what it's talking about. Tenan hatam. Kol hanisok tahor chush zifim vehasapichim. Now that we talked about this uh, zifim, nofet uh, sufim, um, we're going to talk more about um, uh, about Zifin and Sapichim and Devash. So uh, there's a Mishnah in Masechet Machshidin that says anything that, any liquid that's poured is Tahor. They're talking about a case where you take from a Tahor a cup and you pour it down down into a Tameh vessel. And the Halakha is that the Tum'ah of the bottom vessel does not travel through a stream of water to the top one. This was a huge debate. The Dead Sea sect has a letter where they specifically talk about it and they think that that the water does make a connection and the Tumah does flow even upstream through a water connection. The rabbis say it does not. However, even the rabbis agree that when you're talking about Devash Zifim, um, uh, honey, that's, uh, that's thick. Um, and if you're pouring it or wafer uh, from uh, a, a, a batter for, for wafers, like um, uh, um, a pancake batter that, that is uh, thick. And so when you pour it, it's too viscous and that actually does make a connection. And even if you pour it downwards, the tumah of the bottom vessel will go through that upwards towards the top vessel. Um, it's more like a solid than a liquid. Now, we ask, Zifim? Um, why is it called Zifim? Um, it means Zifim like Ziyuf, to falsify. It means this is honey that's so sweet, even if you add other ingredients like flour and stuff, it still tastes just as good because that's how that's how rich it is or another interpretation is based on the place where it comes from it's called zifim because it came from a place called zif um, and there's also we see this as a place name um, uh, when uh, uh, then uh, when shaul was looking for uh, david and the Zifim, the people from Zif, um, said, Oh, David, yeah, he's with us. And they gave up uh, David. Uh, my Zifim, and why are they called Zifim? Even though we just quote, brought this to prove that it's the name of a place, it's also symbolic of this place, of the people of this place. Why are they called Zifim? So because Mizayifim they falsify their words. Uh, they don't speak, uh, they, they, they speak in a tricky way. So the first opinion says they're the ones that spoke deceitfully and they said, oh, uh, David, do you want him? Right. And they gave up David. And so they um, they, they spoke um, badly. Uh, whereas Bielazar says, no, it was just happens to be a place where they're, they're a place where they were from, Zif. And that would be the proof that we have that uh, Zif is in fact a place name. Well, this was a tangent to talk about the uh, the, the sweetness of this honey um, and that has ceased after the time of the Bet HaMikdash. And uh, we'll see a little bit more uh, tomorrow at the last half of uh, further things that we have lost out on uh, with, uh, with the loss of the Bet HaMikdash. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen.